Very good. Open your Bible, please, to the book of Acts, because we're not going to Mark tonight. I'm serious. I want you to find Acts chapter number 1. And uh, we've, we've lived in Mark because Mark, of all the gospel writers, tells us more about the inner circle disciples. I like the fact, the pastor asked you earlier who, who we were studying tonight. You said Peter, James, and John. That's good. Uh, somebody was listening. That's the inner circle. We believe that Peter and Mark had a unique relationship, uh, a mentorship, a friendship. And so because of that, Mark would have had lots of first count, account uh, knowledge of what happened in that inner circle. And so I really think that's why Mark writes more about it than any other. But that's not the last mention of the inner circle. Uh, how many of you have learned anything this week about Peter, James, and John? Would you raise your hand? You've learned anything about them. All right. Then I'm not going to preach first tonight. You're going to preach first. I'm going to give you 30 seconds right now. And I want you to tell somebody next to you something you've learned this week about the inner circle. And if you don't participate, I'm going to bring you to the platform and let you tell everybody. All right. If you're just joining us tonight, make something up. Okay. On your mark, get set, go. Tell somebody next to you right now one thing you've learned this week. <clears throat> Amen. Very good. How many of you think somebody next to you actually did learn something this week? Yes, they did learn something. That's great. Some of you wives need to help your husbands when you're on your way home tonight, all right? And uh, that's very good. It is, not, it is not that Peter, James, and John were given any more of Christ than the other disciples. But it is that the Lord, in His sovereign purpose and perfect will, chose to give them opportunity uh, that some of the others did not have. And I might say that these three men gave themselves to the Lord in a unique way. Now look, I don't care if you're part of the people that got saved this week, and we've had folks back in the meetings night after night who got saved. It's wonderful to me. But if you got saved in the last 24 hours or if you've been saved for 50 years, I want you to know we all have the same access to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's, that's not, when we say the inner circle, we're not talking about, well, that's just the Lord's pet. No, that's not what we're talking about at all. But we believe this, that God makes it so that if you really pursue Him and seek Him and draw close to Him, that the Lord will give you insight and opportunity. And that's not for you to brag about and strut around about and think highly of yourself. This is really not the story of Peter, James, and John. This is not the story of Peter, James, and John. This is the story of Christ in the lives of Peter, James, and John. And I don't know about you. I, I prayed as I came up to this meeting that God would lead me. I do that week by week. Where in Scripture, Lord, do you want us? And it's been years, years since I personally have given much attention to the inner circle disciples. But I knew this is what God wanted us to study together this week. And I'm just testifying now whether it's been good for you or not. It's been very good for me because in my heart, I don't want to just go through the motions of being a follower of Christ. I want to be as near to Christ as I can possibly be. And so I think the Lord lays out for us in Scripture a beautiful progression of truth. Before we read the text tonight, let's review just a second class, all right? Stay with me for a minute. In Mark chapter 3, we found an introduction to the inner circle. And the introduction was, remember, Mark chapter 3, they were with Jesus. And Peter, James, and John were the three of the twelve whose names were changed at the beginning. I love this. Christ changed their names because he was about to change everything in their lives. Now, radically changed all of the disciples, but these three men who he surnamed, he was giving them names that would reflect the nature, the character he was going to develop in them. For example, Peter, Peter, you're a rock now. Well, he was the most vacillating, emotional of all the disciples when Jesus said that. But when you get to the end of the story, he's the rock that stands up on the day of Pentecost and declares the word of Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Then you got James and John, excuse me, two mama's boys. That's what they were when Jesus said, sons of thunder, energy, sons of thunder. And somebody said, those fellows, the ones who just wanted to sit on the right hand and the left? Yes, the sons of thunder. But they will be mightily used of God in the early church. And I'll show you that in just a moment. The Lord began something in them in Mark chapter 3. Then in Mark chapter number 5, we looked at the inability of the inner circle. Fascinating to me that the first mention of the inner circle along with Jesus, they stand in the corner and do nothing. 
We think of Peter, James, and John as being capable, strong men, leaders, right? And Jesus said, you stand right over there because I'm going to raise a dead girl and you can't do anything about it, but I'm going to demonstrate that you're nothing and I'm everything. It's the first great lesson all the Lord's followers must learn. Then we came to that amazing passage in Mark chapter number 9 where we find the invitation to the inner circle. He takes them up on the high mountain apart and he's transfigured before them. Look, he wasn't the only thing that was transfigured on that mountain. They were transformed on that mountain. They came down different men than they went up because they were getting nearer and nearer to the glory and the holiness of Christ. And then we came to that amazing passage in Mark 14 last evening where we sat in the garden, Christ's classroom, and heard the instruction to the inner circle. And what was the great instruction? It was all about prayer, all about prayer. And that's why it's so fascinating to see after the death, after the burial, after the resurrection of Jesus, the next time you see these inner circle disciples, would you like to just guess what they're doing? Would you like to guess what they're doing? In Acts chapter 1, they're praying. They're doing exactly what Jesus was trying to teach them on the hardest night of their lives. And so we come to Acts chapter 1 and verse number 13. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both, read it church, Peter and James and John. Would you mark that in your Bible? Again, mentioned first at the top of the list. Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas the brother of James, I love verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So the next time you see Peter, James, and John, guess what they're doing? They're praying. Never dawn on you that the first meeting after the ascension of Christ was not an evangelistic crusade. It was not a Bible study. It was not a preaching service. It was not after the ascension of the Lord Jesus was a prayer meeting. And every good thing God set in motion in the early New Testament church started in the place of prayer. D.L. Moody said every great movement of God can be traced somewhere to a kneeling figure. And so here they are on their knees, continuing, faithful, in prayer. Come over just a couple pages, would you please, to Acts chapter 12. We're going somewhere, so stay with me just for a moment. Look at Acts chapter 12 and verse number 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. Acts 12 verse 2. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. James, we believe, was the oldest of the disciples from everything we can tell from history. We know this for certain. He was the first of them to die. Outside of Judas, who took his own life, who really was not a true follower of Christ, of these original followers of Jesus, James was the first to die. Pastor of the church in Jerusalem, mighty used of God, uh, given that visibility, and because of that, thrown in prison, and Herod now takes his life. So think, look, I'm trying to get you to, to sit with these disciples for just a moment. These men had gotten close to one another because they had Christ in common. The Lord had changed them. They, they were serving together and praying together and laboring together and working together and believing together and then just like that one of them is taken away and many of you know when the Lord takes a fellow disciple it hurts I felt that pain in the last few days I um, I am grieving I'm grieving the loss of a friend and a fellow laborer uh, today just today uh, one of my other friends an evangelist uh, his wife died she was my age, body racked with cancer. She's gone to be with Jesus now. I'm, I'm thinking and praying for my friend tonight. A death is real, friends. And I'm not trying to be morbid. I'm just telling you, reality check, look, pause just a minute and realize life is short, time doesn't last forever, eternity is real, Jesus is coming, and any moment you could be seeing God face to face. It's sobering. And look, I like laughing, cutting up, and goofing off, and all that kind of thing with the rest of them. And I, I want to enjoy the journey, but I want you to know something. Every now and then, we need to stop long enough to get a sober and serious look at what really matters in this world and in the world to come. 
So you got the inner circle. They're praying together. Then James is cut off. And then I take you to my text. Would you keep turning in your Bible and come with me to Galatians chapter 2? This is fascinating to me. Look at Galatians chapter 2. Now remember, we're far removed now from the book of Acts in the early stages. The apostle Paul is, is in the climax really of his ministry and the great thrust of his gospel advance. In Galatians chapter 2, he's given some biographical narrative information and his interactions with Peter. Uh, look please though at verse number 9. Everybody look at Galatians 2 and verse 9. The Bible says, and when James... Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me. They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Now, take your pen. Everybody get your pen in hand. I want you to mark in verse number 9 this phrase, James Cephas and John. Cephas is another name for Simon, for Simon Peter. This is Peter. The John in this verse is the same John that was one of the original inner circle disciples. But look whose name is first on the list. Would you look at it? What name is first on the list, please? It's a different James. It's not the same James. This is this wonderful. This blessed my heart. You know, there are people in church that are prominent. How many of you know what I'm talking about? They're on the platform. They're leading. They're organizing. They're, you know what I'm talking about. Every church has prominent people. You know what I've learned? I've learned that God uses the prominent people and the people who aren't prominent. That everybody has their place and everybody must do their part. Look, that everybody has their time and everybody has their turn. Look, you got Peter, James, and John. It's always listed in that order in the inner circle of disciples. Peter, James, and John. Say it, church. Peter, James, and John. One more time. What is it? Peter, James, and John. But when you get to Galatians chapter 2, look at it. It's not Peter, James, and John. It is James, Cephas, and John. Two of the three inner circle disciples. And now a new man listed on the list. Who is this James? We believe this James is James the son of Alphaeus. You read that name in Acts 1 just a little bit ago. If you look at the listing of the disciples found through the gospel records, he's always near the end of the list. Isn't that fascinating? He's never at the top of the list. No, no, he's near the end of the list. Would you like to know who James, the son of Alphaeus, was? We believe that this man was the man who is related to our Lord, who wrote the epistle by that name in the New Testament, who, look, please, became a man of greater prominence after the other James died. Watch this carefully. One generation moves off the scene. What must happen, church? Another generation must move on the scene. The older serves God in his generation. How many of you are glad for the older people who serve God? By the way, don't ever lose your gratitude for what the generation that went before you believed and handed off to you. Look, the, the second you lose that appreciation, you've lost something in your spirit that will help you carry it on to the generation following. But when the older James dies, now a younger James comes on the scene. And I don't know why. How many of you believe God's a God of order? Do you believe that? He does everything decently in order. So there's some reason why it was always Peter, James, and John, Peter, James, and John, Peter, James, and John. But when you get to Galatians chapter 2, look whose name's first on the list. Who is it, church? This man that is less prominent, that is less well-known, for some reason the Holy Ghost tells the Apostle Paul under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, write this man's name down first. I'm speaking tonight on the influence of the inner circle. Tonight we're turning the whole thing inside out. To this point, I've dealt with the inner life of the inner circle. Their faith, their holiness, their prayer, what they were alone with Christ in the secret place, what they were alone with God, what God was doing in them. But please don't miss the emphasis tonight. God never works in people just so he can work in people. God works in people so that he can work through those people. See, influence is received so that influence can be relayed. God puts things in you, not so you can keep them to yourself, but so you can pass them on to somebody else. 
Would you like to know why 2,000 years later we're still talking about Peter, James, and John and reading about James, Cephas, and John? I'll tell you why. Because these were men that made the most of their God-given opportunity. But praise be to God, they did not keep it to themselves. They passed it on to somebody else. They carried the baton for their leg of the relay race and then they faithfully handed it to someone else. And I want to tell you tonight on the authority of the Word of God, that must be done in every one of our lives. I'm standing here tonight because somebody invested in me. I remember the man that was preaching the night I surrendered to preach. He invested in me. My dad invested in me. I remember as a kid preacher, pastor, I didn't know anything. My dad would take me places to preach and meetings and, and uh, you know, teenage preachers are a novelty and, and all the grandmas tell you you're the greatest thing on planet earth. And my dad felt like it was his God-given responsibility to keep me right. And we'd get in the car. I remember we'd get in the car. He'd say to me, you talk too much about yourself tonight. <laughs> Wounded me. He said, if you're going to be a preacher, son, He said, stop talking about yourself and talk about Jesus. He helped me. My grandpa died before I was ever born. 57 years old, he died. He was an old mountain preacher in the hills of West Virginia. He didn't have any education. He really didn't. He didn't have a whole lot of couth either, let me tell you. He got preaching in a church one night and said, bless God, there's two things no church needs. That's a clock on the wall and a busy-bodied woman, and this church has got both of them. That wasn't a good thing to say at all. And he didn't stay long in that church either, let me tell you. But you know what Grandpa had? He was, he was a man who walked with God. He had a little gospel tent. He'd sit up and preach. The church I grew up in was started out of one of his tent meetings. I was preaching a revival meeting in a church a few years ago. And I didn't know my grandfather had started that church. I didn't even know he had started that church. I was standing in the lobby shaking hands, and a man came out, older man, shook my hand. He said, son, did you know your grandfather? I said, no, sir. I said, did you know him? He started crying. He said, I didn't just know him. He led me to Jesus. He said, he baptized me out behind the old church in a little pond we had on the property. He started laughing. He said, you know those things you preachers say when you put people under the water? I said, yes, I know those words. He said, he must have been practicing because he held me under a long time that day. (laughs) You know what I'm thinking standing here before you tonight? The lions have fallen under me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I worked for a man for 20 years who invested in me and taught me and was patient with me. I'm thinking about people that you wouldn't know, names you wouldn't know, people that aren't prominent, that aren't famous names, who just loved me and encouraged me and prayed for me and and propped me up. You know why I'm standing here tonight? Because somebody invested their God-given influence in my life. And I want you to know to have that is to owe that. Too much selfish Christianity in our American Christianity. May I say to you, you can talk about the inner circle, but it should never just stay your little circle. Pardon me, but we got too much little circle Christianity where it's all about us. And and, and, and pardon me, when the culture gets worse, we kind of pull the wagons around and like we're just going to talk to one another. You're never going to reach the world talking to each other. Somebody has to get out of themselves and out of their comfort zone and out of their clique and out of their little group and say, by the grace of God, I'm going to pass on the influence that has been invested in my life. Vance Havner said a rut's just a grave with both ends knocked out of it. So get out of your rut, get out of your death, and say, by the grace of the Lord, how can I pass this on to somebody else? And that's what these men did. And so we look at our text tonight in Galatians chapter number 2 to see the continuing principle of the inner circle. Still, three men in this inner circle that seem to be providing leadership and passing it on to the next generation. What do we learn about them? Well, first of all, would you write them down? First of all, we see a a description of them. Notice the very vivid description. The Bible says in verse 9 that they seem to be, what's that word, church? Pillars. Would you circle the word pillars in your Bible? In our world today, uh, I, I, so many facades are built with fake pillars. I was in a place that they had massive pillars, and they weren't real pillars. You know, they were just they were a bunch of foam. That's what they were. Uh, nothing, nothing being held up by those pillars. But in that ancient civilization, pillars actually did something. That's a fascinating idea, isn't it? They actually held something up. They were, they were strong. They were stable. They were supportive. Do you see the great description? These were men. Look, 
that were not blown about by everything going on around them. They were not blown away by every little thing that happened inside the church. They were instead men who were steady and secure in Jesus Christ. They were pillars. This is a term that's used in other places in the New Testament. Maybe to help us to see it. Turn over to 1 Timothy with me for just a moment. Let me just compare Scripture with Scripture for a moment. Look how the same word is used in your New Testament. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 15. What is the church of the living God to be? A pillar. 1 Timothy 3 verse 15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Mark this in your Bible, please. The what? pillar and ground of the truth. In other words, what's the church's role? Look up here just a minute. The church is a pillar that does this in the world. We hold up the truth. We hold up the word. We hold up the light. And for the record, if the church doesn't do that, pray tell me, sir, who's going to do that in the community? The church's role is not to do what every other civic organization and club in town is to do. The church's job is to do the one thing Jesus left us here to do, and that is to hold up the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a pillar. By the way, the only way you have churches that are a pillar is you have to have members who are a pillar. How many of you would like your church to be strong? May, may I take a vote tonight? It has nothing to do with money. All right? Good. Thank you. Let's take a church vote. How many of you would like to see this church stand strong for the next generation for your kids and grandkids if Jesus tears? Would you raise your hand? All right, I'm going to tell you how. The only way to have a strong church is you've got to work on being a strong Christian and developing a strong family. And when every member of the church says, by the grace of God, I'm going to be steady and stable and right where God wants me to be, then God will keep a church that is strong in this place. You don't cast your vote by raising your hand. You have cast your vote by living your life. Show it to you again. Come on over to the end of your Bible. Look at Revelation chapter 3. He writes to, to a specific church, the church at Philadelphia, the real Philadelphia, the one where there really was brotherly love, you know. Look at Revelation chapter number 3. He gives a promise in verse number 12 to those that overcome and hold fast, to those that are obedient to the end. He says in verse 12, Him that overcometh will I make a what? a pillar in the temple of my God. Why would he say that? Because they were living in a world filled with, filled with things that were constantly moving, constantly shaken. Excuse me. Religious temples everywhere that were crumbling all around them that were not stable and secure. And he's using that mental imagery for their minds to understand. He said, I'm going to take you into my temple, into my presence someday, and I'm going to make you one of the pillars there, and you're never going to be moved from that place. Matter of fact, keep reading. He says, and he shall go no more out. Don't you love being in meetings like this? I really do. And one of the things I've noticed this week, when the meeting's done, nobody wants to leave. I mean, I was here late last night. People still stand around talking. It's wonderful. That's a mark of the presence of God. People enjoying the fellowship of God's people. Now, don't you think sometimes in meetings like this, you think, I just wish we didn't have to go home. Could I tell you tonight, the Lord is planning a meeting at his house that we will never have to leave. When we get there, we will go no more out because we will be established as pillars in the house of our God. Do you see the picture here of permanence in the pillars? I want you to know, in a world that's changing, we need some Christians who are not. I'm saying to you tonight, go back to Galatians 2. We need a James and we need a Cephas and we need a John. We need some inner circle disciples that get so close to Jesus, the strength of Christ gets in their soul. So when the winds of adversity come and the storm of persecution descends and the rain of trouble falls, they are not moved from the place where God has planted them. Dear Lord, give us some believers like this. Years ago, I was in the Middle East. We were in Amman, Jordan for a few days teaching him. A Jordanian pastor said, we're going to show you some things. And he, he did. He drove us around about 100 miles an hour through the desert and showed us where the children of Israel walked and took us to Mount Nebo where Moses died up on Pisgah and looked over in the promised land. And that was fascinating. And uh, I just stood there taking it all in, looking over into the, into the promised land. Think about Moses up there. And God buried him. And nobody knows where he's buried except the Greek Orthodox. They tell you right where he's buried. And for $10 a head, you can see it too. It's amazing. But nobody else knows where he's buried to this day. And uh, we saw lots of things. And then he took me to this beautiful body of water. And I scooped some water up and put it to my lips and spit it right back out. And he laughed and said, welcome to the Dead Sea. It wasn't salty. Somebody said, what is salt? No, it was bitter. It was bitter. 
He said to me, Scott, for centuries, the Jordan River put life-giving things into this body of water. He said, but nothing ever flowed out of it. And he said, what I learned here is that life always becomes death when it's kept to itself. You know what I think we've raised in our churches? A bunch of Dead Sea Christians. Pardon me, who sit in church for 40 years, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival meetings, special meetings, soaking it in, soaking it in, soaking it in, and getting more spiritually bloated all the time, and 40 years later, they're perfectly miserable. Now, you probably never have anybody leave this church. You probably never have anybody leave this church. But I grew up in a pastor's home. And I remember people leaving the church, hitting the door on their way out, and they always said something real spiritual like this as they left. We're just not getting fed. You know what I learned about most of those people? The problem with most of them was not that they weren't getting fed. The problem with most of them is they never learned to feed anybody else. They actually thought it was all about them. We have created a consumer Christianity that thinks it's all about us. And I want to tell the inner circle disciples gathered here on a Tuesday night, this is not about you feeling better and getting a warm, fuzzy feeling and saying, we enjoyed going to church. This is about you getting something and passing it on to the generation that is following you. Enough of this, people jumping from church to church and thing to thing and place to place and person to person and looking for another experience and euphoric emotion. Dear God, give us some inner circle disciples who are pillars in the house of our God. And so God gives us a great description of them. There's a second thing I want you to see. It's not just their description. Notice their dependability. These are men who can be counted on. Counted on for what? Well, first of all, write this down. Let's make it a list. Number one, they can be counted on to pray. In Acts 1, when they didn't know what to do, what did they do? Pray. In Acts 1, when they needed to make a decision, what did they do? Pray. In Acts 1, when the persecutors were swirling, when the future was uncertain, when the emotions were overwhelming, what did they do? They prayed. May I tell you the first mark of a spiritual person is they turn everything to prayer. That's not our world. No, no, what we want to do is talk to each other about it. Why do you think social media is so popular? We have a hard time. We want to tell everybody about it. We want somebody to say, bless your heart. Nobody but you and Job has been through anything like this before. I mean, you just, may I just tell you, pity is not going to get you through what you're going through, but prayer will. Churches have ebb and flow. Your church is on a flow. It's good, isn't it? Does it always flow? Mm -mm. No church always flows. I know church members that think it should always flow, and if it's not always flowing, they're going to flow somewhere else. I want you to know, it's a body. It's just like your body. There's good days and bad days. There's up days and down days. There's in days and out days. That's just the way it works. There's an ebb and flow in in the body. There's an ebb and flow in the work of the Lord. There's spiritual warfare and there's stress and struggle and strain. Just get over it. Get used to it. It's part of life. A man that is born a woman is a few days and full of trouble. There's no perfect church, no perfect pastor, no perfect deacons, no perfect people. Look, but we have a perfect Savior. And when things aren't exactly like you want them to be, let me tell you the best thing you can do. Talk to the only one who can change it, and that is God. Did you know God has a complaint department? He does. It's called prayer. Let me speak as a preacher for just a moment. There are meetings when you're preaching where it's just like the Holy Ghost is is blowing at your back. It's like, I mean, it's like. The wind of heaven's carrying you along. How many of you preachers know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's just like, you know, man, thank you, Lord. And then there are messages where it's like you're wading through molasses. I'm serious. I wish everybody had to preach one sermon in their life just to stand up here and look at what we get to look at, you know. I'm serious. And sometimes you're preaching and you're laboring and you feel like I'm not getting anywhere. And let's just get real for a minute. Every sermon's not the best sermon you ever heard. Can't be. But is that why we came? How many of you ever were in a meeting where you knew the preacher was struggling? I've been there, and I was doing the preaching been there. You know what carnal people do? I'm going to tell you what carnal people do. They cross their arms and say, it's not his best sermon this week, is it? I'm going to tell you what spiritual people do. Spiritual people recognize, you know what? The devil's fighting. God's up to something. Lord God, help him right now. Oh, Holy Spirit, energize him right now. 
Do you understand that spiritual people must be counted on to be prayer partners and prayer warriors? That's where it starts. That's not where it ends. Here's a second one. Write this down. Look at Galatians 2 and verse number 9. They could be counted on to be discerning. This is interesting to me. The Bible says they perceived the grace that was given to Paul. That word perceived, dear Lord, give us some more perceptive people who have a clue. I'm not talking about earthly wisdom and knowledge and education. I'm talking about the wisdom that comes from above. And there's a beautiful order here. Watch. Who was it that was perceptive? It was the people who had learned to pray. Do you see how discernment grows out of being in the presence of God? The closer you get to Jesus, the more you're going to understand what you're supposed to do. The more you're going to discern what's going on around you. Do you know there are lost people that come into meetings like this and sit down in meetings like this and listen to guys like me preach? And they, they, would, be, they would be willing to respond to the gospel. They'd be willing to talk to somebody if somebody near them was discerning enough to say, I'm praying for you. I'm so glad you're here. Could I answer any question for you? Can I help you in some way? And just sensitive to what's going on around them. You know the name Billy Graham, right? You know the name Billy Graham? The Graham got saved in a Mordecai Ham revival meeting. That's pretty common knowledge. Mordecai Ham, old raw bone, leather lung preacher, and holding a tent meeting in Charlotte. And Billy said he kept coming to the meeting, coming with friends, and it didn't matter where he sat in the tent. Mordecai Ham found him every night, and pointed right at him, and preached at him. So he had a great idea. You know what he did? He joined the choir. It's a true story. He joined the choir. He later said, "I thought if I sat behind the preacher, he couldn't point at me." Graham said, Mordecai Ham turned around that night and preached half of his sermon to the choir. True story. That's not why I'm telling you that, though. That was the night Billy Graham got under such conviction, he responded to the invitation, and he came down to the front with hundreds of other people, and he was standing in that big crowd of people in front of Mordecai Ham. He'd come to be saved. But Billy Graham said, I looked to my right, and there was a man sobbing next to me, just tears pouring down. He was just broken up. And he said, I looked to the other side, and the guy was just rejoicing and happy. And he said, I thought, I don't feel either one of those emotions. Maybe I misunderstood. Maybe this is not for me. And Billy Graham turned to go back to his seat. <laughs> Think about this. And a businessman from the city of Charlotte, a tailor, saw him, knew who he was. Stepped up next to him, put his arm around him and said, Billy, could I show you from the Bible how you can have your sins forgiven? And Billy Graham said, yes, sir, you can. And that's how Billy Graham got saved. When I read that story, I thought to myself, you know, everybody talks about Mordecai Ham's preaching. That's not what got Billy Graham saved. I'm going to tell you what brought him to Christ that night. It was the discernment of a spirit-filled man in that place. I wonder what would have happened if that man had not obeyed the Holy Spirit. Graham had gone back to his seat. I wonder if all those people would have heard the gospel and been saved through his ministry through those years. I mean, you think just a minute. You know what we need? We need some churches full, not of talent, but of discernment. And in days filled with error, God knows we need more perception. Here's another one. Write this down. They could be counted on to be encouraging. The Bible says they gave the right hands of fellowship. I love that. Somebody said, you mean the handshaking time is more than that? The right hand of fellowship meant that they were, they were lending their influence. They were, they, were lending, they were lending their good name to this man's ministry. Dear Lord, give us some people like that who are not in it for themselves and what they can get out of it. They're just trying to help everybody else along on the journey. Could I challenge you to do something? Every night I've walked in to this meeting. Somebody's greeted me at the door and folks have smiled. And nice to see you, preacher, and we're praying for you and all that kind of thing. But could I challenge you, every member of this church to do something? When you come to church, don't just come in and plop down somewhere. You walk around and see who you can speak a good word to and encourage them in the Lord. There have been a lot of meetings that I've been in where I don't remember what the preacher preached. And don't look at me so pious. You, you too. But you know what I remember? I remember some dear old saint of God saying to me, I don't know why, Scott, but I've had you on my heart all day today, and I just want you to know I'm praying for you. Look, if the only exhorting that ever happens in this church is what comes from the pulpit, I want you to know this church can never be everything God wants it to be. But when every member says, I want to be one of these pillars, I want to be one of these encouragers, God will use you to strengthen the entire congregation. Here's something else. Write this one down. They can be counted on to advance the gospel. Look what they're doing in verse number 9. They are giving the gospel themselves to the, the Bible says to the circumcision, that's to the Jews, and they're helping 
Paul, go to the heathen. That's to the Gentiles. How many Gentiles are here tonight? Would you raise your hand? All right, let's do this again. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile, all right? So how many Gentiles are here tonight? Would you raise your hand? How many of you are glad that the gospel is to the Jew first and also to the Greek? Praise God for the also, right? God's heart's heart for all people. Christ died for every man. And so look at this. It's to the circumcision and the heathen. It's to the Jew and to the Gentile. These were men that said, we're here for one purpose. We just want to get the gospel out and get sinners in. We want to get everybody saved we possibly can. We need a revival of evangelistic zeal and fervency in our churches, and that should not be limited to the visiting evangelist or the pastor of the church or the assistant that oversees the outreach programs of the church. Every believer ought to get consumed with eternity enough to say, by the grace of God, I want to get somebody to Jesus Christ. Ask the Lord to make you such a person. One more They could be counted on to show compassion. Look at verse number 10. Only they would that we should remember the poor. I love that. They cared about people. Did you know sometimes people can do church work and not do it in compassion? You can have ministry and programs. You can preach sermons and there'd be no love in it. You can can do things in the community and there'd be none of the spirit of Jesus in it. Where's our tears, church? Where's our love for the poor? Where's Where's our heartache and heartbreak for the needy all around us and what sin has ravaged homes and broken lives? Look, when you look at people down and out and having a hard time, instead of just shaking your head and saying, that's bad, look at them through Jesus' eyes and love them in Jesus' name. Ask God to baptize you with the compassion of Jesus Christ. These are the men that move a church forward. These are the members that keep a church going. It's not all the public things you see. Let me give you one more thing and we'll stop tonight. Not only do you see their description, their pillars, and their dependability, they counted on in all these areas, but notice please their development. Please don't miss this because this is really the whole thing this week. We read verse 9 and verse 10, but I love verse 11. You do know all Scripture is connected, right? Verse 11, but when Peter was come to Antioch, (laughs) Paul's writing this, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Do you understand that even if you're an inner circle disciple, there's always room to grow? If I said to you, who's the most prominent of the disciples and the most mightily used, most of you are going to say, Simon Peter. I mean, good night. He preached on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people got saved. And I mean, he wrote two books of the New Testament. Look how God used that man. That's right. But you do understand that though he had a perfect Christ, he was not a perfect man himself. And just because you're saved doesn't mean you're sinless. And I repeat something I said to you on the Lord's Day. You want to know the mark of an inner circle disciple? They never think they've arrived. Never. They never get to the place where they can't be reproved and rebuked and corrected. You know you can tell a lot about a person by how they respond to rebuke. Like as long as you're cheering them on, patting them on the back, and telling them how wonderful they are, it's easy for them to like you and feel real spiritual around the place. But then you get in their face and say, look, we've got to deal with something here. You can tell how truly spiritual a person is by how they respond to that correction. And I want to say to you tonight, even pillars need to be polished. You may be a pillar in this church. I don't know who the pillars in this church are. I have a little idea of some just from being around the place for a few days, but I don't really know who the pillars are. And, and maybe everybody else doesn't know exactly who the pillars of the church are. We, you hear people talk about the pillars in the community. He's a pillar in the community. Only God really knows who the pillars in the churches are. By the way, pillars don't have to be propped up. They prop up. Pillars don't have to come be pumped up and primed up by the preacher and come on now, just serve Jesus a little more. That's not a pillar. A pillar is somebody that says, by the grace of God, I'm going to stand where God has planted me and I'm going to be faithful until the very end. But I want you to know, even the faithful people need to be open for God to speak to them and show them where they are in error. You know what's really interesting? This is the last mention of, of these inner circle disciples linked together like this, and it, and it ends on a note of growth. How many of you think that's on purpose? There's no place to stop. Somebody says, well, I'm, I'm one of those inner circle disciple preachers. Well, I want you to know, if you're an inner circle disciple, you don't think of yourself that way. You're just in passionate pursuit of Jesus every day. <laughs> 
See, this book is not just a lens on Peter, James, and John. This book is a mirror on all of us. And as we look at it, we realize God's still working on us. And he's working on us so he can work through us. Look, and he's putting some things in us. And he's bringing us closer to his side. Why? So that through our lives, the whole world could be reached. You want to turn this city upside down for Jesus? I'm going to tell you how. You get as close to Jesus as you can. And you say to God, Let the Holy Spirit get out of my life everything that dishonors Christ. And Lord, you fill me so much with Christ that when I open my mouth, what comes out is Jesus. And I tell you, you get a church full of pillars like that, and God will touch the world. When I was about 14, my dad had just taken his first pastor. It's been there 33 years now. I had surrendered to preach. I was just a young boy preacher, and dad was pastoring. And the church was booming. Just a little country church in West Virginia, but it had exploded. Hundreds and hundreds of people were coming. and People were getting saved and added to the church, and you couldn't even get them in the building. And, I mean, it was just it was one of those things you knew the Lord was at work, and, and it was exciting. I mean, it was just you couldn't wait to get there. And when you got there, you didn't want to leave, and it was just amazing. Have you been around long enough to know when God is working like that, the devil's going to poke his ugly head up? And there was a man in that church that became a messenger of Satan. He became a mouthpiece for the devil. Remember, even Peter did that. Do you know you can be an inner circle disciple and speak for the wrong person? How would you like Jesus to look you in the face and call you the devil? Get thee behind me, what? That's pretty rough. But you can speak and say things you ought not say. There was a man in the church that just got out of sorts. He was not really a spiritual man. Looking back, he really was not a spiritual man. But he was well respected by people. And so, you know, people thought, well, he must be saying the right thing. And, and he was just full of criticism. He started bringing division. It was awful, awful. I'm watching my dad through all of this. I remember my dad standing Many times preaching, tears streaming down his face. I'd sit on the front row and watch my father, tears streaming down his face, and he's just struggling his way to get through the messages. He was having the hardest time of his ministry. One night we were leaving the church in the parking lot, and that man accosted my dad in the parking lot. Got in his face, put his finger in his chest. My dad had preached, was preaching through the book of Nehemiah. I still remember that man. And he, he pointed at my father, and he said, If you ever... Preach another message from the book of Nehemiah. Can you imagine saying that to the preacher? I was in the car already. It ticked me off. I got out of the car. I was going to whip him in Jesus' name. That's what I was going to do. I still remember my father. By the way, he's been there 33 years now. I still remember my dad. He put his hand up. He said, now, son, he said, you get back in the car. The Lord will take care of this. And he did. Martin Luther said, always remember, even the devil's God's devil. He knows how to take care of you. At that same time, there was a man in our church named Neely Mills. I can't wait to get to heaven, hug his neck. I was too young to realize it all at the time, but let me tell you who Neely Mills was. You've never heard his name. He was a pillar. He was a James, a Cephas, a John. That's who he was. He was a World War II veteran. I can see him right now. (laughs) He opened the door. He was the door greeter. He opened the door for the services, and then you'd walk in. How you doing, Brother Mills? He always gave the same answer. You know, once a Marine, always a Marine. That's what they say, right? Semper Fi. He would walk through the door. How you doing, Brother Mills? He always gave the same answer. At my post of duty. That's what he always said. At my post of duty. Good military man. He was a woodworker. And see his hands now scarred up, had his own wood shop, made beautiful things. He didn't qualify to be a deacon, but he was a servant. (laughs) Mrs. Mills, God bless her, but she made the greatest peanut butter pie in America. It was wonderful. Neely and Francis Mills, that humble little couple in our church, nobody thought much about them. He didn't lead any services made it their business 
to encourage my dad and our family. I remember at the end of meetings, my father just broken hearted, just broken hearted trying to pastor this church and keep it moving forward and work through all of it. And I remember Brother Mills would come up. Uh, if nobody else spoke, Brother Neil, uh, Mills would come up, put his arms around my father and say, Preacher, I love you. I'm with you. God's with you. Don't you quit. You stay in this thing. We're in this thing together. God's using you. I've thought many times, Pastor, about that man. I don't know if my father would have survived at that church. And honestly, I don't know if I would have even wanted to have been in the ministry if it had not been for Neely Mills. I think when we get to the judgment seat, a lot of prominent folks are going to step to the side and some of the Lord's humble servants who just steady as you went, stood right in their place and did their part, are going to be called to the nail-pierced feet of Jesus to receive the real rewards. You know what we need a revival of? We need a revival of some inner circle disciples who will not think it's all about them. Who will believe they're a part of the greatest thing on planet earth, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and will do what they can right where they are. And I'll tell you, on the authority of the scripture tonight, if you will be such a person, God will use your influence to carry on his work to another generation.